Uh, so glad to be here for uh, the second event in our series and just really honored um, to, to have our special guest uh, this evening. So thanks all for joining us for this second conversation in the series, celebrating the art and culture of Kentucky. Some of the bluegrass is black. The first series uh, in our uh, program featured uh, Frank X. Walker, whose poetic declaration that some of the bluegrass is black remains with us and resonates across time and across genres of art. Black visual artists from the Commonwealth have been featured across the nation and globally. You can travel across our national landscape from Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles and find the creative productions of Black Kentuckians coast to coast and everywhere in between. Our guest today certainly has a national and global footprint. I'm so pleased to welcome Mark Lynn Johnson, Glassmaker. Mark is currently the president of Art Inc. Kentucky, a nonprofit business and marketing incubator serving Kentucky artists operated through community ventures. Mark was born and raised in Lexington, Lexington uh, and spent a number of his formative years growing up in the city's uh, historic East End. After graduating from the University of Kentucky with a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics and a minor in Economics in 1989, Mark be began a very rewarding career in the field of banking. He became one of the youngest vice presidents uh, at his bank, but had a desire to become more uh, of service to his hometown and his home state. Uh, and he left the banking industry and became involved in the nonprofit and small business development field for which we are exceedingly uh, grateful. And it was during this time that he started pursuing his artistic endeavors in glass making. Uh, he expanded his artistic body of work to not only include glass making, but abstract painting and creative photography as well. He was invited to show a collection of his work at one of New York's largest art shows, Art Expo. And as a result of that, Mark was offered an opportunity to show his work at the Louvre in Paris, France, and shortly thereafter was recognized by Art Tour International Magazine as one of the world's top 60 contemporary artists of the year. And he participated in a group show in Florence, Italy, where he received his award. His uh, work is in the permanent collection at uh, EKU, at the John uh, Grant Crab Main Library. Um, he's been invited to show his work in a number of places, in, including at EKU's My Kentucky State of Mind, an ex, uh, exhibit of uh, contemporary African-American artists. Um, most recently, um, in 2020, in celebration of Black History Month, he was invited to show his work at the NAACP's Evening of Elegance, uh, celebrating African-American artistic expression. Mark's uh, reach is far and wide. Um, his most proud accomplishments, however, are being dad to his two sons, Matthew and Mackenzie, as well as their rescue Chihuahua Picasso. And I'm gonna drop um, some links here in the chat. If you would like to um, uh, have a look at his bio in more more detail, so I'll share that. But thank you all. Mark, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we know how lucky we are to have uh, this hour with you this evening and how lucky we are to have not just your work, your uh, artistic and creative productions, but really the work that you also do in the community. And we uh, look forward to hearing more about that tonight, for being here with us. Thank you. I, I am um, exceptionally honored to, to be here this evening. So thank you for the opportunity. It's a great honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about your journey to glass making? Um, how did you find your way there? Um, so um, I have to go back quite quite a long time um, to tell you about my journey to glass making. My very first business was an antiques business. Mm. My grandmother and really my entire family um, 
as I was growing up, they had uh, old fashioned vintage antiques around the house. My parents, um, they were, uh, they had antiques and my father collected antique cars. So there was just vintage and antique things around everywhere. So uh, that was my, that was actually my first uh, endeavor um, into becoming an entrepreneur. Um, I sold um, vintage pieces on eBay. We were in a number of um, the peddler's malls. And through that process, we would go to state sales and yard sales. And, and through that process, um, I just kind of eventually found um, glass, the, the vintage and antique glass makers, Fenton, uh, Smith Glass, a number of, of the old time uh, and antique glass makers. And I just absolutely fell in love with it. Carnival glass, milk glass. I just absolutely fell in love with it. Um, so that's where, uh, as I started doing more research and finding out how they created their pieces, that's where my initial love for making things uh, kind of came from. Um, it didn't start with glass. It actually started with uh, my first making endeavor was um, polymer clay. I made mm. jewelry pieces. Out of, out of polymer clay, bracelets, and necklaces, and, and things of that nature. That's what actually, uh, that was my first endeavor into making things. But uh, eventually, as I became more skilled in that area and, and met more people and, and just um, got into it more, I eventually got into um, uh, glass making. Um, started with uh, making beads. Uh, from there, it got, got into um, working with uh, called kiln forming glass and from there it went into blown glass so it's been a very much a, an evolutionary an evolutionary process great 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 i would love to show um our audience uh one of your your earliest pieces and maybe we can um pause for a moment to have a look at uh the piece that was sort of your uh, foray into your entrance into uh, glass making and maybe you can tell us a little bit. Um, I'll just share uh, that image very briefly. Um, can you talk to us about about this piece? Yeah, so this piece has a, a lot of significance to me. Um, it wasn't the very first piece that I made, but it was the piece that um, I kind of thought you know, I can make beautiful things out of out of glass. Um, it wasn't perfect by any stretch of the means. I, you know, it was, and it went, and, and it was absolutely not uh, sellable uh, at that time. But I did feel like, um, in my own mind, the beauty that that came about as a result of it, that um, I could, I could, I could do this. Um, so I still have this piece. It's sitting on my in my living room today, and it kind of reminds me of my my journey. Um, kind of where I started and kind of there, there is, you know, there's still more, there's still more to learn. Um, so, so yeah, this piece is, uh, it's always going to be uh, special to me. I always try to keep the very first piece in each one of my series as I, mm -hmm. as I bring on new bodies of work, I always try to keep uh, the very first piece that I made uh, in that series and in that body of work. Uh, but this one will always have a, a very special, uh, special significance. It's from my Dichroseics series. Um, it's dichroic glass. Uh, and, and really the special thing about dichroic glass is uh, depending on the view or the angle that you're looking at it, it actually changes, it actually change, changes colors. So this is a uh, kind of a convex um, platter type shape. Um, I think it was about maybe 18 inches in, in diameter. Um, so yeah, it's it's a uh, the uh, it was a, a very labor intensive piece. That's why I don't do a whole lot of these. Uh, it's it's very labor intensive when it comes down to um, the the cold working and the cold working is the process of working on the glass outside of the kiln when it, when it's not hot. Um, there's smoothing of the edges and grinding the edges and making sure that you don't have any sharp uh, sharp pieces on it. Um, there's a lot of labor intensive, uh, labor intensive work that goes into that process. And that's why I just don't do a whole lot of them because it's, it is very labor intensive. But um, the I'm final sorry. result, the, the end result is. 
I'm so struck by the complexity of, of colors in your piece, and especially this um, this series, but in all of the series, there's just a degree of complexity of, of hue and color. I'm wondering, how do you how do you get to that complexity? Is it something that you go looking for, that you plan for? Does it emerge? Can you just tell us a little bit about that experience and the process? Yes, yeah, so the the color has always been the kind of the framework of my of my creativity. Um, and I don't know if that goes back to me being a kid and, you know, absolutely being in love with comic books and, you know, seeing all the colors in the comic books. Um, but, but striving for, for, for color has always been uh, kind of the, the core of my business. And depending on the, the particular body of work, um, it can be very deliberate, uh, very intentional. And some of my other bodies of work, it's very random. Uh, for example, the, the piece that you had up there, um, I had a general idea as far as I wanted that piece to look like in terms of the, the color and the distribution of the color throughout the piece. Um, but it wasn't that specific. It, I, I can never say that it was as specific as it, as it came out. I had a general idea. Um, but in some of my other work, I, I have a very specific idea and I'm able to translate that and manipulate that color the exact way that, that, um, that I have it, that I've pictured in my mind. So it really just kind of depends on the, on the body of work. Um, so. I'm really interested in that, you know, you're using the terms of sort of like manipulating glass, working with it. I'm really interested in your creative interaction or your relationship with the material itself, right? We see glass, you know, hard, strong, you know, can last a lifetime, but also something that, you know, we perceive as delicate, as fragile. And I'm just wondering, you know, are you manipulating the material? Are you embracing it? What's, what's your relationship as you are in the process of making? Um, my relationship with glass, a friendly competition. I'll, I, I think <laughs> I'll call it a friendly competition. Um, I do manipulate it. Um, it also manipulates me. Um, I would like to think at the end of the day, we're both trying to get to the end result of we both want something that's going to be beautiful and something that's going to be admired and hopefully bring some joy to mm -hmm. individuals. Um, how we get there, the process, how we get there, sometimes it, uh, um, it's not as, as efficient as I would like. Uh, sometimes there are, there are uh, failures. Um, obviously, you know, glass breaks. Um, even when you're doing everything that you think you should be doing correctly, um, mm -hmm. or for no other reason, uh, it, it breaks on you for, um, it also teaches you patience. Um, there is a, a warm up period with glass when it's in the kiln. There's also a cool down period. And um, many times, and, I, and I've been guilty of this many times, uh, I try to short change that process, mm -hmm. uh, try to rush the result. And, you know, and, and unfortunately, sometimes uh, it makes you pay for it. So by, by cracking. Um, but yeah, at the, at the end of the entire process, though, I would like to. Um, it's taught me patience. Uh, it's, it's a very humbling material. Um, in some cases, it cannot be um, refused. It can't be put back together uh, because maybe you have a design in the glass and there's no way that you're going to be able to uh, recreate that design. Um, but in some cases, you know, in some cases you can. So, um, yeah, it just kind of, um, again, it kind of depends on the body of work that or, or the series, um, but it can be, you know, it can be a, a very re rewarding material as well. Um, I'm struck by the way that you've described it. it. It makes me think that there are even life lessons to be learned from, from the process, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, it's taught me patience and it's taught me um, humility. Um, you know, when you think you have done everything correctly. And, you know, you have this image in your mind as far as what you think that final piece is going to look like. And you open up the kiln and it's, it's you know, broken into a dozen pieces. Um, you know, it's, it can be a very humbling process. So 
Mm -hmm. It makes me wonder about, um, you know, that that process of making can can, you know, teach us so many different things, a process of art making. And when we relinquish that work of art, right, to a customer, an audience, you know, a gallery or what have you, there's a different kind of interaction that happens. And I'm wondering when you're making your art, um, what is it that you want people to feel when they engage with your work? Is that something that you are thinking about at the beginning? Is that something that happens later on? But, but what is it that you're hoping that folks get from interacting with the work? Yeah, I, I think I've become a lot more conscious of that um, these last several years. Hmm. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, obviously life has been challenging for, for everyone. Um, and I think what I, at least what I hope that my, uh, that any of my art, not just necessarily my glass, but, uh, you know, this goes for my, my photography work, my, you know, glass bead jewelry work. Um, I hope that even if it's just for a moment, it's able to bring, um, some joy into someone's life. The, the texture of the piece, the, the tactile nature of glass. Um, I'm hoping that uh, it allows people uh, a moment of respite from some of the challenges that they're dealing with on a on a day-to-day -day, on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. If they can smile um, again, even just for a moment, as a result of um, some of my artwork then that's something that I can feel pretty, I can pre feel pretty proud about. I, I love that. Thank you so much. And the power of, of that, right, of being able to, um, to reach across and touch someone, even if you're not with them, but your, the body, you know, a piece of your work is that there's something deeply personal and a kind of intimacy and humanity in that. Um, I'd love to have a look at, um, let me see if I can pull up some of your, your beadwork here as this scrolls uh, through. Um, and if you can tell us a little bit about um, some of this. And uh, so you've you, you moved, shifted from, from clay to, to glass at the beadwork now. Has that been a, a very different experience? Are there similarities in that evolution? Um, there, there are some similarities. Um, you know, obviously, uh, regardless of the, the material, um, jewelry is something that uh, a person is, is wearing uh, to adorn themselves with. So obviously you want it to be beautiful and um, you know, the aesthetic nature of it. Um, the fact that uh, I went from uh, working with polymer clay to working with glass, I don't know that there's uh, anything significant or, or spectacular about that. Um, heat was a, a part of, of both mediums. When you're working with clay, there is a firing process and a drying process that you have to go through there. But there was still the being aware of color and, and, uh, and putting colors together and um, you know trying to come up with a, a beautiful piece. So I don't know that there was necessarily a, uh, a lot of difference between the clay and, and the glass. Um, it just so happened that um, I evolved into the glass making as a result of of my desire to work with that work with that material, um, but at the same at the same point, uh, you know, I still hope that there's something beautiful that comes out there. Uh, the color is still uh, important, um, manipulating and putting those colors together. Um, so all that still still remains. Have you ever encountered someone wearing wearing something? Yeah. What was that experience several, like? Several times. Um, <laughs> It's, it's, again, it's pretty humbling uh, when someone you're, you know, maybe you're out in the mall or, or wherever, you know, and uh, someone recognizes you and um, someone purchased a piece, one of my pieces for them for a birthday or anniversary or something like that. Um, it, it just kind of reinforces, you know, the influence that we, that we as artists uh, have on people. I would, I would hope, and I would uh, like to think that I never take that for granted, but when you're a part of people's celebrations, uh, when your artwork is being given as birthday presents 
anniversaries, wedding presents. Um, you know, that's, uh, you're, you're sharing with people's most um, special moment. You know, you're, you're a part of that process. You may not necessarily be there physically with them, but um, something that you've had a hand in creating and something that you've touched and manipulated and created um, is a part of that, is a part of that special moment, those special moments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Really cool, really cool feel. Yeah, it makes me want to go back to something that you um, said a little bit earlier um, about uh, um, sort of being conscious of how, you know, what you want people to feel and sort of acknowledging, you know, the current moment, whether it's the tension in our world, whether it's the pandemic, the, all the things that shape our lives, right? That shape our lives as humans, as you know, black people in a in a tension-filled nation or with the global pandemic, all of these things. I'm wondering how that makes its, you know, how does that present in your art making? Is that, you know, does does it does it shape how you interact with the work? Do you ever go to a piece of work, you know, as sort of a response to, to what's, you know, going on? I'm just, I'm interested in that, that dynamic there. Um, I, I can't say that it's a, um, it's a conscious okay. process. Okay. I can't say it's an, in, it's an intentional process. I, I would like to think that my artwork, um, you know, to me, the most, the most powerful thing that uh, artwork can do is uh, prompt conversation between people. Uh, and maybe those people are, um, you know, diametrically opposed to each other uh, in terms of their views. Um, but maybe, and, and this is you know, kind of one of the things maybe I hope that my artwork is capable of, uh, it's able, those two people are able to uh, find at least one thing in common that they both think that that artwork is beautiful or they appreciate the artwork and then maybe from there from that one little uh, moment of, of agreement it can kind of spark additional conversation well if we can agree on this maybe we can you know continue conversations maybe we can agree on other things and um, I think that in the in the great global scheme that would be um that would be my hope for, for my artwork is, is that it really can prompt those types of conversations and bring people together that first off may not necessarily come together for, for any other reason. Um, but as a result of that, uh, it, it, it starts that dialogue and, and then maybe they get to know each other and maybe they're able to find commonness from there. And then maybe they're ever, they're able to um, be from there. That, that to me is, uh, I think that would be the whole. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, I'm so interested in, in, in that, right? The idea that, um, because we know art can move people, that art, um, you know, can have just such a powerful impact on us. And I think that, you know, um, one of the things I want to maybe share with the audience and have a look at um, is your uh, pieces from your sibling series, which um, I know is an sort of evolution from your dancer series, and I'm I'm so intrigued by by this because of it. You know, there is a kind of relationship between the the pieces, in my view, and I'd love to hear you talk about that because, in a way, I see that as you know, the, as that is as a sort of model for what you're talking about wanting to you know what you want to the art to do uh you know with people and their interactions let me just um share my screen very quickly here and see if we can have a look and if you can tell us a little just talk to us a little bit about the sibling series yeah so um the sibling series that's an, another um very special body of work for me um, I'm an only child, no brothers or sisters. Um, but growing up, I always wanted, I always wanted a sibling. I always wanted a, an older sister. That would have been my, been my dream. Um, to be able to have that relationship and to be able to have that, um, that feeling 
of someone that you know, no matter what, it's always going to be, they're always going to be, uh, you know, your, 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 your sibling. Um, there's something that I, I yearned for when I was a kid. Uh, there was something that I yearned for for that. Uh, and I think it's something I still yearn for. Uh, mm-hmm. As a result, I, I, I hold my friendship very, very dear to me. And uh, you know, my cousins and, and things of that nature there, I hold them very dear to me um, because of that um, that bond um, that, that comes with those relationships. Um, not that I don't think it could ever replace the bond uh, of, a, of an actual sibling, but that's kind of how the sibling uh, theories, the whole body of work kind of came about was, was that yearning and, and that desire uh, to, have, to have a brother or, but yeah, it, that's a pretty, that's a pretty special piece for me. I guess from the, from the glass work, you know, it's just uh, two pieces that complement each other. They're similar. Uh, and they complement each other. Maybe one's a little bit bigger um, than the other, but uh, at the end of the day, they they complement complement each other. And we're and they, looking at, at, and at they one support, of the, and they support each other. As well. And we're looking at just one of the examples now, but but um, I I know and I've seen that you know color again comes into play with the sibling series, and I'm wondering if if there's something different that you're doing with color in the sibling series or is it in the same vein as uh, what you're doing with your other pieces? Um, uh, it, it's the, you know, the, the importance of color in my work is, is paramount. Um, that's, you know, that's, I, I've always been drawn to the color and how colors interact with each other. And I've, you know, drawn that from um, nature um, nature has been an inspiration for that. Mm. Um, so the, the, and that's it throughout all my work, not even just my glass work. That's, that's been throughout all of my work. Uh, so uh, depending on the body of work, it's been the, um, the application. How does color fit into that specific, uh, into that specific body of work? Uh, the very first piece that you, that you showed uh, from my diprosaics um, body of work uh, that was literally pieces of colored glass that were, that were placed uh, within that overall body body of work. Um, very very labor intensive, very time uh, mm. time intensive. Um, my my newest body of work, my Tremonto series, uh, the color is um, it is almost brushed on um, using glass paint. So. Um, the commonality between all my work ha- has been the color, um, mm-hmm. how that color is um, uh, manipulated, how it's utilized, uh, how it's applied uh, to the medium. Uh, that's kind of been the that's kind of been the, uh, the the evolutionary the evolutionary process. Mm-hmm. And the work has grown from whether it's abstract painting to my Fountain Fall series, the work that was shown in Paris and Italy, uh, to the glass work, to the glass bead work. That's kind of the commonality between all the all that. Mm-hmm. I know we episode. spent so much time talking about glass, but but I am interested in this work, the the uh, photography, um, because that has you know brought you uh, all over the world, and it really uh, has. Yeah. you know we here uh, uh, in in the domestic local space you know, say Mark Van Johnson, glass maker. Uh, but yeah, I, I let me um, share uh, a couple of image here, uh, images here. Yeah, tell us a little bit about, um, about the, your, your photography and um, some of the other, other works that you have. Yes, so uh, in terms of my photography work, that, that's the Fountain Falls series there. Um, Six, seven, eight, nine years ago, um, my my glass studio um, it flooded. My the water tank flowed while I was on vacation, so I came back to a studio uh, that had about four or five inches of four or five inches of water. Um, so you know, as a result, uh, you know, I was not able to um, you know to to create my glasses. I had to had to go through the process of 
renovating the, the glass studio. Uh, throughout that process, though, I had a serious desire to be able to express myself from a creative perspective. I, I you know, no longer do my bead work on, on my glass, but I had a, um, a huge desire to somehow still be creative and still create create beautiful things. So I had already purchased um, quite a bit of camera uh, camera gear uh, because I was taking pictures of my taking pictures of my glasswork. Um, and literally through a very, uh, you know, Bob Ross talks about happy accidents. Uh, it was it was literally a, a, a happy accident um, where I was in the kitchen one day with my with my sons, and uh, we just happened to take a photograph of, of a water drop, and, and that's what that's what this body of work is. It's, it's literally uh, water drop collisions. And you just happen to capture it at that exact moment, uh, and and you create um, hopefully something beautiful, but but at least something something interesting to to look at. So as a result of that, um, you know, we added a few uh, a few elements to it. Um, the color uh, is food coloring, uh, and, and literally what these are uh, are uh, containers of containers of water, and it's macro photography. So you're you're very close up uh, with a lens. Um, high speed photography, and uh, to be able to incorporate my my glasswork, uh, what you're seeing in the background, the the different colors in the background, that's my that's my glasswork. Mm. Um, so, you know, it always has to be, at least in my mind, going forward, uh, the glass always has to be a part of it because that's how I do, I, I do identify myself as a as a glass artist. Um, Photography is, is something that I do um, kind of when I need a break from glass, uh, but um, you know, identifying myself as a glass maker, if, if I can only you know, have one term, that, that, would, be the, that would be the term. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's how I'll always see myself. Um, but uh, so that being said, um, the photography work was really another aspect for me to create uh, something immediate, um, whereas with the glass, you know, there is that, again, coming back to that patience and, you know, it's several hours and several days before you're even able to open up the kiln and look at the final piece and uh, did it come out and, and all that stuff, whereas with the photography, um, you know, instantaneously, whether you have something, you know, something that's worthwhile um, there or not. So that's the, that's the other part of my need, that's the photography that fulfills that part of, uh, of my needs. Um, the patience, the glass teaches me patience. Um, the photography work is my immediate need for, you know, gratification and, and, uh, and instant, instant beauty. So that's, that's kind of how they, uh, they both work and, and they feed off of each other. Uh, sometimes I take a break from one and, and I go to the other. Uh, and even between the glass, um, Sometimes I'll work on bowls specifically, and then sometimes I'll work on my flame work and glass beads. And then, um, so, you know, they all kind of uh, revolve around each other. And then there's an evolution uh, as a result from, from all, of those, all of those bodies of work. Glass makes its way into the photography work. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, that's just, the, it's intriguing to think of how, you know, the different uh, uh, medium, uh, you know, interact and, and, and shape, you know, uh, uh, each other um, and, sh you know, the glass shaping the photography and, and vice versa. But I'm, you know, what, what stands out to me is, is the fact that this new, you know, this body of work uh, came out of, you know, you call it a happy accident, but I can't imagine, you know, coming to your studio and seeing the damage and not being <laughs> able to make, you know, your your artwork. But 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 that's so beautiful that that you you took that moment right and created and something something else beautiful came out of that. And I and I think that is just such a, a wonderful wonderful point to to emphasize and and there are some some new things on the horizon with the photography uh can you tell us about that um so um i've been working on a book i've been approached to do a book for my series and i've been 
um, you know, with everything else that, that's been going on, um, I've been asked to uh, um, put some images together and, and create a book out of it. Um, I'm about halfway through in terms of the number of images that, that they want. Um, so I need to get back into that, into that body of work as well. Wonderful. I think I have to be in that specific frame of mind. Uh, and I just haven't been in that specific frame of mind. I'm really having uh, the glass series that I'm working on right now, my Toronto series. That's kind of my, um, my ode to the Italian glass makers. Um, this has probably been my most, it's the body of work that I've had the most fun with and, and have developed the most appreciation. I'm, re I'm really having a good time. That's great. That's, that's wonderful. We love, we absolutely love to, to see it. And the, one of the things that uh, is a thread in your work, right, is, is, is really how it connects to community, to people, to nature, to our lived experiences. And, um, you know, your work as an artist um, goes beyond art making itself, but also into sort of curating, right? Communities of, of artists and um, particularly in the historic East End, right? Where we live, <laughs> it's my neighborhood too, right? <laughs> um, in this historic black community, um, you're doing some, some, some things to, to really energize, to, um, you know, recognize the art that is that is being made here, um, and that in itself, I think, is a kind of art making as well. Can you talk a little bit about that endeavor? Yeah. So, um, and first off, you know, um, let me say that I've had so much help in in that process. Um, obviously, you know, the board and everyone at Community Ventures. Um, you know, the donors, the, the funders that have participated in, in, in all the projects, uh, certainly the artists um, that are involved. Um, it hasn't, it hasn't just been, been me uh, at all. Uh, there's been, uh, it, it takes a village, you know, and, and it has taken a village uh, mm -hmm. to, to create everything that we're, that we're doing. And it's been a huge blessing. Um, but that being said, um, this really, um, that, that, aspect of things started about four years ago with the de desire uh, based on my own history and my own experience in being a creative uh, entrepreneur um, trying to help artists um, not necessarily have to make or or uh, making their journey maybe a little bit more efficient than, than mine was uh, helping them get to the stages that that they want to get to in terms of sales and uh, exposure and, and things of that nature. Um, just kind of trying to create something um, that could help artists achieve their achieve their dreams. Um, and I was just fortunate to be able to all the you know all the the moon and the sun and the stars kind of aligned all together, and, and we were able to to create this um, this incubator concept, the, the Art Inc. Uh, incubator concept, and uh, you know, it's been an amazing, it's been a really amazing journey uh, to see the, the journey that some of our artists have taken, some of the success that they've received, um, creating my own artwork and the, um, the joy and satisfaction that I get when someone spends their hard-earned money and, and, uh, and purchases one of my pieces. Uh, that's a certain kind of joy, but to, to see that um, joy and, and that um, excitement when it comes to other artists, um, it, it, it's, you know, it, there's no feeling like it in, in the world. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's just been um, such a blessing to be able to share in that dream and that, and that passion and, and that, those journeys of, of all the artists that have been uh, involved with the incubator, whether it's um, the artists in the artist village, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, the artists here in the in the uh, in the gallery, uh, the artists in our studios, uh, to be able to be a part of of all of those lives and see the work that's being created and and the intentionality and the beauty that comes out of it's 
been it's been really amazing uh, beyond beyond any blessing Great, right. thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's really wonderful to, to live in this neighborhood and um, you know, to, to see that, to, to be able to enjoy art and, and feel what it does in the lives of our you know, neighbors. And um, yeah, it's, it's a really wonderful, wonderful thing. Thank you, thank you so much. There's, there's just so much history in, in East End, uh, you know, with the lyric and uh, you know, all the artists that, that have played at that venue and the significance that that particular venue has in this community, and there's more, you know, I could all be, I, I could go down, you know, I could go down the line, but um, to me, when I think of of all of that and, and what has gone on at the Lyric and, and how that has um, translated into the community and the sense of pride that that translated into the community and the sense of community, you know, that that meant to the neighborhood um, to be able to come back and, and do all this. And, um, you know, and, and just even in a small part, just, um, you know, catapult off of what the Lyric has, has done for this neighborhood. Um, you know, that to me is, has been, it's been, a, again, a special, special thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's been great working with the lyric and, and having being in the in the neighborhood and the community and the people and um, you know to be able to to bring all this to fruition. Um, it's just been really an, an amazing thing. I, what are your you know it, it, it's such a wonderful thing that, you know and as we think as we look ahead just to imagine um, you know what um, what this means for artists. Um, I'm wondering what your hopes and aspirations are for artists, for, for Black art in the Commonwealth. You know, what do you want people to, to see or say or experience, you know, five, 10 years from now? Yeah. Um, you know, and that, that's a really, that's a really uh, great question. And it's a, a very powerful question. Um, I, I don't know that I have given a lot of thought, you know, to, you know, to five or, or 10 years, you know, I've been so worried about or, or so, you know, focused on, um, you know, the, the here and now. Um, but, you know, if I could uh, kind of pull out my, my crystal ball and, and look, you know, five or 10 years into the future, to say that uh, we've um, created a, a, a venue or we've created a, a place where um, artists can come together and, and people can come together to experience the arts and maybe not necessarily uh, people that would come into this area um, for any other reason, but because of the art, maybe they, they're coming into the area and, and we're using that uh, at the Met we're using that as a way to translate history and to memorialize history, thanks to a grant that we were able to receive from the National Endowment for the Arts. We're using art to be able to uh, communicate those stories and the significance of, of East End. Um, so there's a, um, I don't know if education is the right word, but but there's a an illumination that, that occurs as a result of, of the art. And um, uh, those artists, the process that they go through and the stories that they tell uh, in, in creating their art and then the storytelling that goes about in um, communicating those stories to, uh, you know, to the outside, to the outside world. Uh, and that can be Lexington, that can be Kentucky, uh, that can be, you know, that can be the nation. Um, mm -hmm. It's just a way to uh, to make sure that um, history isn't lost. Uh, it's a way to make sure that um, important aspects and important people, African American people, um, important venues uh, that were frequented by African Americans, and important events that um, that affected African Americans aren't aren't, aren't lost. Um, and again, kind of going back to the earlier conversation, that can prompt a conversation between 
uh, someone that maybe was not aware of that. And maybe that conversation sparked something else and maybe that sparked something else and, and so on and so forth. And now all of a sudden uh, you've got um, you know, a conversation and um, an understanding where maybe before there was not, there was not an understanding. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if, if, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, if that can be uh, part of the legacy that um, has, has come about as a result of all this, uh, where communications and conversations have, have taken place and um, history has been maintained and, and um, um, memorialized, um, that would be, I'd be okay with that. Wonderful, wonderful. And we have, you know, also in this area, very, also, you know, lots of kids and, and young families. And I, you know, it just makes me think about when you say the word legacy and history, right? Or education, that kind of knowing that is so necessary to, to pass on, right? Um, and in places like the lyric, we see the manifestation of that, those things are, are happening. I, you know, I'm inclined to, if I can squeeze in another question before we talk to the, to the audience, I'm wondering, sure. You know, some people might think, oh, you know, an African-American glassmaker, what an anomaly, you know, but but I <laughs> across the world, right? I've been on the continent of Africa and seen, you know, glassmakers in Ghana, for example, right? And so there is, you know, there are multiple threads of, of legacies. And I'm wondering for you as a glassmaker, you know, as you think about your work and even passing on that tradition and legacy, I'm wondering if that's something that that you've thought about, if that's something that would be important for you to, you know, your art making and your aesthetic or that craft to, to, to pass on. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the short answer to your question is is yes, absolutely, okay. and, and more more so here lately. Um, mm. Getting older, my sons are getting older. They're going into their next stages of life. Um, I, I've been blessed that uh, that one of my sons has decided to uh, kind of take on the arts. Um, I'd like to think I had a little bit to do with that. Um, so so yeah, um, seeing seeing whatever that looks like uh, being passed down to him, um, his understanding and his appreciation of, of everything that we're doing in the artist village, for example. Um, all the artwork that he's seeing as far as the history here at, at the Met. Um, however, that gets translated down to him and he um, takes that and, and kind of uh, use that as a springboard for, for his uh, artistic endeavors. Um, yeah, that's that would be that would be pretty cool. Wonderful, thank you, thank you for that. Um, we have just he, he loves Frank, by the way. So oh. Frank, <laughs> Frank hung the stars and the moon and the, and the sun, as far as he's concerned. So, you know, be able to you know have a uh, you know get him involved in the artist village, and um, he's going to be next to Frank. That's that, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that and that's the thing I think. Um, you know, I sit here and joke about it, but. Um, that's the thing that I hope that this, this entire thing um, brings about is giving the youth that opportunity to experience um, someone that they can, that they can be inspired by. Um, I don't recall having that, you know, growing up uh, in this neighborhood. I don't recall seeing my first African-American artist. Um, you know, I don't know that um, that I knew what a poem was, or um, you know, or anything like that. Certainly, I didn't know what glassmaking was. Um, but to be able to provide that now, to have that opportunity now, um, and to be able to provide that to to the youth um, in the community, um, you know, again, it's just a it's a pretty pretty special thing, and, and it just so cool that you know all the the funders and the donors and the, and the artists that are a part of this process. Uh, it's just a, a really a really special thing. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, before we we take questions and and some of these comments um, from the audience, I just 
want to, to say thank you so much, Mark, for uh, not just your time today. I know you're a busy man with lots, lots to do, but we appreciate your time and your sharing. And uh, we appreciate your stunning work. And of course, um, everything that you are, are doing for our community and communities of, of artists uh, in, in Kentucky. So thank you so much. Um, I see some uh, questions uh, popping in. Um, let's see here, let me scroll back. There was a, a question about, you mentioned the earlier on the competition uh, with, with the glass, that sometimes it is a competition. And uh, uh, it looks like Bill wants to know, how do you go beyond the competition with the glass uh, to one of collaboration? Uh, he'd just like you to say a little bit more about that. Oh. I, I don't, and I'd have, probably have to give some a little, little bit uh, more thought, but I don't know that I see it as a collaboration. Um, and maybe that's just the way I, I approach it. To me, um, at the end of this pro, at the end of the glass making process, if I have a piece that is beautiful and and more so than more so than often has survived the glass making process, that I don't have a crack in or significant chip or or a fracture, um, that to me is kind of the the competitive side of things. Um, you do your very best and. Hopefully you come out with something that, that that's beautiful. Um, and whereas um, you can still do your very best and um, just because you, you lose the piece. So now you've got all the time and all the effort um, that, you know, that has just, that has just gone by the wayside. And, you know, and that's, um, you know, and that's a loss. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's just, the, the, the frame of mind that I'm in, but uh, that's, uh, it, 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 it feels like a competition sometimes, mm -hmm. with, uh, not necessarily a, a collaborative. But that's a, that's a, that's a good thought. I, I probably need to think about that a little bit more. <laughs> we have a couple feels, questions. It feels very that, much like a competition. <laughs> <laughs> we have a couple questions that uh, deal with sort of um, our moment and the evolution of of your work, but also community. Chris wants to know, how has the pandemic changed the philosophy of community in your work and gallery and what positive ideas have come from it? Yeah, that's, that's an amazing question. Um, I, and I can, I'm speaking from, from myself, um, I'm an introvert, have always been, have always been an introvert. So um, the pandemic to me, um, not necessarily getting to, uh, to socially interact with people. It wasn't, I think it wasn't as difficult for myself as it was for, for my son, for example, my youngest son. I mean, he's very, very social, very, uh, you know, he, he, he thrives off of being around his friends and being around people and things of that nature. So when I'm down in my studio and working and, you know, and it's just another day to me, um, you know, I'm okay with that. Um, I saw that in other artists, though. Uh, that need for for uh, social social interactivity to to be around each other, and that's actually one of the main reasons that we launched uh, the uh, the studios uh, was because we knew that there were artists that you know they were working in their basement, they were working at their kitchen tables, or they were working in their bedrooms creating their artwork, and because of uh, you know, the, the pandemic, they were not able to have that social interaction. Uh, so what we were able to do with the studio is they still have their own private spaces. They still have that um, place where they can go and create their work. But there's also that additional aspect where they can come together and, and be a part of be part of a community. Um, and it's a beautiful thing. Um, I'm, I'm beginning to appreciate that even more now that I see the uh, you know, the, what comes about as a result of that connectivity and that interaction where artists are collaborating together. And that was the whole goal for the Artist Village and 
uh, you know, the gallery and bringing artists together um, to where they can um, learn from each other and, and grow from each other and maybe do projects together. Uh, that's been, that's always been the goal for mm -hmm. all of it. Um, be able to sponsor. Em somehow. Emily has a, a question um, and we'll have this be our final, final question of the evening, but um, it connects to that. Um, she wants to know how this large community endeavor has affected your own identity as an artist. Um, and if you can share a little bit about how your identity as an artist is changing and evolving, if so. Wow, I mean, wow, it's another great question. Um, if this experience has taught me nothing else, um, it's taught me to be able to appreciate being an artist. Mm -hmm. um, like you said earlier, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of power that comes uh, from the ability to be able to create be able, create beautiful things and uh, hopefully to have those things uh, sponsor conversation and um, and communication between especially between people that may not necessarily uh, communicate or, or or have conversations. So. Being able to kind of be a, a little bit um, removed from that process, uh, you know, when you're an artist, you're kind of right there in the middle of it, and, and you know, it's right there, and it's, it's right there on top of you. Uh, but when I'm able to, in my role at Art Inc., when I'm able to kind of stand apart from that and see how those artists are interacting with each other and how they and the impact that they're having on the community, um, that's it's. it's you know, it's just a, it, it makes me appreciate what, what I'm able to do, uh, even. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to our viewing audience uh, for being here. Thank you to folks who submitted questions. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share in our chat the link for Art House Kentucky, so you can experience uh, some of the uh, artists, some of the community that we have been talking about. Uh, Mark, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for, for taking the time, uh, taking this hour with us uh, this evening for uh, celebrating the arts and culture of uh, the Commonwealth. Well, thank you again for the, for the opportunity and thank you to the uh, Kentucky Arts Council for sponsoring and, and thank you for asking me um, and again it's just been a really cool thing. Thank you so much have a good evening folks we will see you next month for uh, the third installation of our uh, program have a good evening everyone. <laughs>